Hi everyone, I am McKenna. I'm the owner of Murder by the Book in Houston, Texas, and I'm very excited today to um, be hosting this event for uh, the Dra Daggers Drawn Anthology. Um, we're going to be joined by several authors and the editor, Maxime Jakubowski. Um, all of these are um, Dagger Award short stories, so we've got quite a, a good group of authors here um, joining us from the UK. And if you like our anthology events, we have several others coming up, including um, one for crime writers of color um, and um, uh, something else that escapes my mind right now. Anyway, um, for our full event listing, you can always find that at murderbooks.com or we have all of our events up through October um, on our Facebook page. Apologies for the dog barking. Um, that is the life with these virtual events. So, um, if you're interested in more information about the authors or this book or to order a copy of the book, I've just put a link in the comments right now, um, both in Facebook and on YouTube, and um, you can click there to order. Also, if you have questions for the authors, don't be shy. Um, we will get to those about 45 minutes in, but I will be monitoring, for, looking for questions. So there's no such thing as a stupid question. We'll get to those in a little bit. Okay, so let's get to the um, stars of the show. First off, we have the editor, Maxime Jakubowski. How are you today? Thank you for having me. Thank you for being here. It's going to be a, a delightful conversation, and I'm certainly looking forward to listening to it. Let me run down your bio really quickly, and we'll, we'll get the other people on here. Um, Maxime Jakubowski is a crime, erotic, science fiction, and rock music writer and critic. Jakubowski was born in 1944 in England to Russian, British, and Polish parents, but raised in France. He's also lived in Italy and has traveled extensively. Again, you're here today to talk about the Daggers Drawn um, anthology. So we also have Danuta Ray. How are you? I'm fine. Thank you. Thank you for being here. And Danuta Ray, who also writes under the name Carla Banks, was born, <clears throat> excuse me, in South Yorkshire. She's past chair of the Crime Writers Association. She's a regular speaker at national and international conferences and literary festivals and has appeared on radio and television. For several years, she was a member of the writers group Lady Killers with Leslie Horton, Priscilla Masters, and Zoe Sharp, who did a talks and readings around the country. Thank you again for being here. All right, next up we have <clears throat> Martin Edwards, <coughs> excuse me. Um, he's a British crime novelist whose work has won awards in the UK and the United States as a crime fiction critic and historian, and also in his career as a solicitor, he's written nonfiction books and many articles. He's the current president of the Detection Club and in 2020 was awarded the Crime Writers Association's Diamond Dagger, the highest honor in British crime writing in recognition of the sustained excellence of his work in the genre. How are you today? I'm very well and delighted to be joining you uh, across the Atlantic. It's great fun. <laughs> Excellent. And last but not least, we have we have someone who's having some technical issues, not Lauren. Lauren's here, but um, we hopefully will be joined by Larry in a minute, but we're going to bring Lauren on and get this started. Hi, Lauren. Hello, darling. Hi, I miss you. It's so good to see you. All right. Lauren Milnderson is an English freelance journalist and novelist who also writes as Rebecca Chance. Her books include glamorous thrillers, bonk busters, chick lit mysteries, tart noir, romantic comedies, and young adult. Between 96 and 2011, Henderson published 17 books under her own name. She began writing as Rebecca Chance in 2009 and now writes novels exclusively as Rebecca Chance. Okay. I'm going to leave you all to it. I'm going to be looking for Larry. I'll add him in awkwardly if that happens. And um, if there are any other technical issues, I'll just pop back on. Otherwise, have a wonderful talk. Thank you, Michaela. Thank you. OK, uh, thank you for joining the Dagger's Room panel. Uh, basically, we're here to talk about this book, which is, hold on, get it in camera, Dagger's Drawn, which is a collection of short stories, each of which has won the, the UK Crime Writers Association uh, Short Story Dagger Award. And uh, basically, uh, as McKenna mentioned, uh, Danuta was vice chair of the association some years back. Martin uh, was uh, more recently the actual chair. And uh, now uh, I've recently taken over the mantle of chair and it occurred to me that um, 
over the years, there have been so many wonderful short stories which have been given the award, and of course, great shortlisted stories too. And um, nobody had thought of collecting more than one volume. So what I did was uh, I went through my shelves and uh, we read all the stories that had been given the award. And I think you know, I'd have to check my introduction, of course, uh, to get the date right. Uh, um, that uh, the short story Dagon was launched in 1982, even though for the first few years it wasn't actually called the short story Dagon, but it was under the influence of uh, the Crime Writers Association uh, and um, was an award given to the best short story submitted to the association. Um, and was the award was sponsored by a champagne company and the winner won both money and uh, a dozen bottles of very expensive champagne. But the rule... Rub it in. Rub it in. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you, you'd be... Um, anyway, and um, initially in the first uh, two or three years of the award, when it wasn't still yet officially the short story dagger, uh, basically, uh, every year, uh, the judges, uh, which consisted of uh, the critic uh, HLF Keating and uh, other people from the association, uh, gave a uh, number of uh, themes or rules which every story had to include, and uh, which was quite a challenge. Uh, and the opening story of the anthology was one of the first ever winners and was by uh, a lady called Madeleine Brent. Of course, we've now, we now all know that Madeleine Brent was a pen name for Peter O'Donnell, who wrote the Modesty Blair stories. And uh, his story, Swift in 98, is the story that opens the anthology. Well, from, 19, from 1985 uh, onwards, uh, it became the CWA short story dagger given to the best short story published in the UK during the previous calendar year. And uh, some, in my opinion, all the best stories are in this book. We've had to leave a number of stories out, two of them because of copyright problems, because they were not available. Uh, stories by the late Reginald Hill and the late Robert Barnard. Uh, Reg Hill's story purely because his publishers are issuing next year his complete short stories in one volume and didn't want the story to come out second. And Robert Barnard, there are problems with the uh, with the estate. So, and the interesting thing is, of course, uh, we have 19 stories in the book, but of course, uh, there have been uh, 39 winners over the years. But and Danuta, of course, is one of the great people who actually won it twice, uh, as have uh, quite a few other writers, including Franklin. <laughs> Uh, Reginald Hill, uh, uh, Jerry Sykes, uh, who's in the book and is probably one of the forgotten writers because he, he gave up writing about 20 years ago, but uh, had a blitz over a few years where he was an incredible short story writer. So we've got basically one of the very first short story uh, winners uh, in Peter O'Donnell's story, and of course the penultimate one, which was Robert's story, which was uh, given last year. And, uh, oh, sorry about the noise, but the postman delivering with you something. <laughs> anyway, that's basically the story uh, of the uh, Daggers of Dawn uh, anthology. I said, it was one, like any editor or writer, you sort of go on in life and suddenly you have like lightning and the most obvious things come into your mind and you think, why hasn't it been done before? And this was a natural idea. I took it to one of my publishers and they agreed instantly and uh, they've been so happy with the book and the book has been chosen in the UK as um, one of the Waterstones, which is one of the, one of the main British chains, uh, main crime selection for September. And as a result, even though the book has already, has only just appeared in England and America, um, the publishers have already asked me to do a follow-up volume, which will be a selection of shortlisted stories over the last 38 years which will enable me to bring in a lot of 
other wonderful people who've never won the award but have been shortlisted. People like uh, George Pelicanos, Michael Connolly, Mickey Spillane, Max Allen Collins, Christopher Fowler, and many, many others. So that'll be for next year. We haven't come up with a title for the follow-up, so if anybody listening today has an, an ideas title, as the Dagger Strike again or whatever, <laughs> ideas are always welcome because titles are really difficult to find. You should ask me. I love titles. Well, you know I love so, my titles. You should ask me. <laughs> I've asked you now. <laughs> anyway, I mean, I wrote a book called "Freeze My Margarita." I'm really good at titles, so, so let me have a think about that. Absolutely. Now, um, what I'd like to do, uh, I was going to start with Larry because, of course, his story went back about uh, 25 years. In fact, I, I just read uh, Larry's uh, novels. Uh, American Hero, and uh, uh, which was filmed with Dustin Hoffman as Wag the Dog, and Larry was in London, and we met. And I said, uh, I asked him uh, at the time, I mean, do you ever write short stories? He said, uh, nobody ever asked me. Uh, and he wrote a story which I included in one of my anthologies, which at the time was called New Crimes, and it won the award. But uh, even though Larry is in the United States, he's in Woodstock, uh, he's, he appears to have technical problems, so uh, hopefully he might join us. So what I'd like to do is basically go in reverse order. So I will come to Martin uh, and ask Martin, uh, basically, your story, let me see. I mean, of course, um, I'm checking the year you won it. Uh, Your story of it won the award in 2008. Yeah. It's called The Book Binder, the book binder's Apprentice. Yeah. Can you tell me about, about where the idea came from and about the genesis of the story? Yes, uh, thank, thanks, Max. And uh, The Book Binder's Apprentice is, is one of those stories. And it, uh, I, I think we'll all agree that sometimes you have a vivid uh, incident which sparks a, an idea that always sticks in your mind. And sometimes it's a whole combination of things that get mixed up together but the book Binders Apprentice was one of those stories which came to me um, pretty much complete in in one of those flashes of inspiration uh, that you were talking about Maxim and it, it was um, one evening early one evening in Venice one of uh, my favorite places in the whole world uh, walking uh, along the streets of Venice with uh, uh, with my wife Helena, and looking in the uh, windows and uh, just soaking up the wonderful atmosphere uh, as the as the heat reduces and uh, uh, there's just the first uh, hint of uh, of evening and night. And um, one of the uh, shut windows uh, uh, in this particular part of Venice um, was a book binder. And I always love to see books wherever they're on display in any, in any bookshop. And, and this particular book binder had some wonderful uh, bindings uh, in the window on, on display. And uh, I, I was quite entranced. The, the things of beauty. Obviously, uh, a man of very great skill. It was a, was a man, it was a very, very elderly man who, uh, who was sitting in the back of the shop. I, I discovered, uh, and um, as I was looking at these bindings, these very exotic in some cases bindings, uh, a thought occurred to me uh, about uh, uh, how a book like that might come to be, and uh, without saying much more, that was really the genesis of the book Binders Apprentice, and it. Uh, uh, it was an idea that hit me pretty much straight away. I spent the following afternoon sitting in one of the, uh, uh, the squares in Venice, scribbling a few notes, and when I came home uh, a couple of weeks later, I, I wrote the story up. Uh, and it was a story I, I really enjoyed writing, which always helps. And uh, it was a, a memory of a wonderful trip and a wonderful place, a place I've, I've been to many times over the years. Uh, and... Uh, uh, of course, getting that story published, first of all, and then actually uh, winning the award that night uh, 
uh, what, 13 years ago, as you say, was, uh, was just a fantastic experience. It was the very first award I, I'd ever won in the crime writing field. Uh, I'd, uh, I'd been nominated uh, a few times. I'd, I'd come uh, runner up to Benita uh, uh, with a short story, uh, the first time she, she won. But it was the first award of any kind that I'd ever won in the crime writing field. So it was a very special occasion uh, and for me a very special story and a uh, uh, bit of my uh, literary history. And, and, and uh, your entire trip deductible. <laughs> it's always, it's always. <laughs> and, and in fact, uh, also an unusual story for me so far, it's now the second time I've anthologized it because yeah. after it won the dagger, I selected it for my best British mysteries of the year. You so did. this is now the second time I've anthologized it. You did. I, I'm in your deck once again. Well, I mean, the story speaks for itself. Uh, Danuta, um, when I went through obviously all the winners and we read them, of course, so you've won it twice. So, in the instance of the people who won it twice, like you or Ian Rankin or Peter Lovesy, I actually contacted him and said, Well, I like them both, but I can only use one. And I asked you, Which one do you prefer? Which one would you like to see uh, republished? And you decided that uh, I could republish uh, the Dummy's Guide to Serial Killing. So I know you're not a serial killer. I know you're an academic. So where did, so the, you think. Where did the inspiration come from? Well, the, the first story that I won with, it's great to be able to say that, uh, was called No Flies on Frank. And it was about an unfortunate, well, relatively unfortunate man who inherits a maggot farm from an uncle and becomes a serial killer by accident. He sort of bumbles through life, killing people without meaning to. And his maggot farm makes a very useful sort of disposal place for getting rid of the bodies and saving him further embarrassment. And I had a lot of fun with that. Um, um, and I was asked to write a short story for an anthology and a bit of me wanted to do another sort of funny serial killer one, but I'd, I'd, I'd already done that. And I think like a lot of people, I played around with the Dummy's Guide to series, you know, like, I don't know, the Dummy's Guide to Butterfly Taxidermy and things like that. Um, and I just thought, the Dummy's Guide to Serial Killing. Um, so rarely for me, the title came first. And I thought, what can I, I love that title, what can I do with it? Um, and the original idea was an incompetent serial killer trying to follow the Dummy's Guide. But I thought, no, actually, I don't want this guy to be sympathetic because this is someone who genuinely wants to be a serial killer ergo there's nothing sympathetic about him at all um but obviously there is an element of tongue-in-cheek about the whole thing but um i just like the idea of this very unpleasant man in his room and he aspires to be a serial killer and he's stumbled across this book the dummy's guide to serial killing and as he plans his first killing, this is his debut night. This is big night for him. He's reading through the book and he's quoting bits of it and he's trying to see if he's got everything right. Um, and it just, once I'd started it off like that, it just kind of flowed. And the different characters, not many of them, sort of stepped on stage at the right time which is very unusual for me because I find short stories very difficult to write, but this one flowed nicely. And at the end of it, I thought, yeah, I like that. And I was so pleased when, first of all, the editor entered it for the um, award because it wasn't actually a crime collection as such. It was a very eclectic collection about fables. Um, and then, of course, to win again was just absolutely brilliant. So uh, it's great to see it in the anthology. And yeah, twice winner. I mean, yeah, you know. <laughs> Lauren, you won it last year. Uh, and here again, obviously, like, the, like uh, Martin, it's 
the second time I've anthology, I think because in fact I commissioned the story for my previous anthology with Titan, who are publishing Brothers Gorn. And your story is called At Me Too. And uh, which always came, which was a terrible problem for me because I haven't I haven't got the hashtag on my keyboard. You so have to keep the hashtag on your keyboard. Everyone's got the hashtag on their keyboard. I don't know. Somebody will have to teach me how to, find out, how to find out the hidden hashtag. <laughs> anyway, where, obviously, I know where the inspiration came from, but can we have it in your own words? Well, yeah, it's going to be pretty dark. Um, although the story is incredibly timely because it's post Weinstein and it's a Hollywood producer who is seriously, serially abusing young actresses, I actually have been trying to write this story or get a specific thing into a story or novel. I, I actually thought it was longer, but since 1993. Because in 1993, Peter Greenaway made a film called The Baby of Macon. I don't know if anyone's seen it or is aware of it. Yep. I mean, mm. so Greenaway, never great with women. Um, the setup of the film is basically that there's a group of actors uh, playing a historical medieval narrative and that there's a virgin in it. That's the character's name. She's called the Virgin. And um, at the end, the Virgin is considered to have sinned. And so she is sentenced to be raped to death by, I looked it up today, 203 men. And we don't see that lovely, Greenway, lovely. I don't think made much of that. And um, you see it because it's kind of done on stage. I could only fast forward through most of this. Set this crap. Um, behind it's behind a curtain and you hear her screams and um, at the end they pull back the curtain or they reveal that um, they, the actors actually did break the actress to death. And this was like there was a huge deal about Peter Greenaway's search for the perfect actress to play the virgin who would be raped to death. And an actress called Julia Ormond got the part who went on to have a you know small but steady career uh, to some degree in America. And ever since then, this was, nine, it was 93, so it's 18 years ago, you couldn't talk about what the fuck did this, what the fuck just happened? Who made this film? Why did anyone make this film? Why did anybody think this was a good idea? This is completely vile on every level. Um, so I kept trying to write a short story or something from the position of the actress that this is your big break. Congratulations, you got a great part. You'll get a lot of publicity and you're a virgin who gets gang raped to death. Cool, thank you so much. And then I started thinking, well, what were the auditions for that like? How long were, you know, how many girls, you know, had to um, simulate this? And then when Me Too hit, and, you know, I was not in a short story vein. It was, this would not have happened without Maxim saying, write me a story. And I did keep saying, oh, I'm not sure. And he was like, just do it by October, just do it by October. I was like, okay, okay. Um, and it was incredibly easy now because I, I could write it now i don't know if i'd written it 19 years ago if anybody would have even wanted to touch this material um I, the story the weinstein details if anybody knows them are absolutely grotesque and because it's a crime the good thing about making a crime story is i could get all of those in because if you can um write detailed descriptions of flesh being flensed from bones i remember ages going to the theater with John Connolly in New York, and I'd start his book, and I was like, John, flensing, really? He was like, people did it, it's a, it's a word, people did it. You know, so it was quite common in the time. I haven't made that up. Um, but if you can write that kind of detail, and if you can write about prostitutes being tortured to death really gruesomely, you can jolly well sit there and read about Harvey Weinstein. So that was fantastic. And um, I absolutely love it, and it does have a twist, um, but it, is the culmination of everything I ever wanted to write when I was starting that story, which is also partly to question why these girls get in this position in the first place. And one of the things that I did find out, because I've got friends in like film and theater, is that most casting directors are women, as a lot of editors are women. Um, and it's because traditionally they always got blocked from director, jo director jobs and to some degree producer jobs. It's only quite recently that um, they're not. So, you know, here are these women who aren't actually doing the job they want, which is much less paid than, you know, being a director or being a producer. And they and the female agents, Ditto, are 
the ones sending the, the young girls in knowing what's going to happen to them. So I got to explore that as well. And yeah, um, I was I was freed up by the hashtag Me Too movement. So that was great. And are you aware of the fact that uh, serendipitously, uh, almost at the same time, uh, there was a film, uh, a small American uh, art film done called The Assistant. Called which what? Called the what? Film called The yeah. Assistant. The Assistant. Oh, yes, I've seen it. I've seen yeah. it. I was yeah. worried. I, I'd written the story already, but I was worried that um, it would be too similar. But actually, mm -hmm. thank God, although The Assistant is, by all accounts, a much more accurate representation of how Weinstein behaved because it's... Um, the offices were apparently really nasty and sordid and small, and it was all very unglamorous. I kind of Rebecca chanced it and, and glammed it up. But apparently, the assistant is a, is is a pretty damn accurate representation, and it's the same story in that the young woman who sees what's happened to this girl tries to do something about it. Yeah. Wonderful. So, unfortunately, Larry doesn't seem to have been able to join us, but uh, we'll keep on talking. Uh, I mean, what I find uh, interesting is that, I mean, all of us here write not only short stories, but we also write novels. So I'd like to ask, and we'll do it again in, uh, in the same order, we'll start with Martin, if he, if he will. Uh, how do you approach, what's the difference for you between writing a short story and uh, writing a novel? I mean, apart from the length and the amount of time involved, of course. Well, is, well, there, is there a different way of looking at it? Yeah, I, I, I think so. I, I, I love reading short stories for start, uh, and I love writing them as well. I've, I've probably written 70, 70, 80 short stories o over the years, and um, they, they appeal to me for a number of reasons. First of all, you can experiment in a way that is more difficult, possibly, but more difficult with a novel. You, uh, if, if you're experimenting with a novel, you're potentially committing a year or two years of your life to something that may never even see the light of day. With, with a short story, it's an investment of a much shorter period of time. And that, that I think, for me at least, um, uh, is, is quite uh, uh, emboldening. It, it encourages me to try things that either wouldn't work in the novel uh, at all or, or which would be too outlandish. So I've written one short story in the form of an index to a book, an extract to an index. Uh, uh, I've written another short story which was um, uh, like a set of acknowledgements in a book. You know, something very popular nowadays, you, you pick up a book and there's lengthy acknowledgements. Everybody the author has ever met is, is thanked uh, at some considerable length. Very often. Well, I, I turned that idea into a crime story. Things that wouldn't really work but in the length of a novel, I think the short story is ideal for. You can also try out ideas. So when I was thinking of, of a new departure as a novelist, uh, a book that became Gallows Court, I had the idea for character. And I decided to write uh, a novel about a character and a situation rather than um, plan it in any way, which I'd, I'd done more in the past. But because that was quite a risk, uh, from my point of view, I had no publisher, no contract, anything. I decided to write a short story about the character, Rachel Savonek, just to see whether I enjoyed her company, whether I enjoyed writing a, a, about this woman. And I found that I did, so I went on and wrote the book, which did take me three years. But it eventually became, in novel terms, the most successful novel I've written. So the short story in that in instance was this kind of gateway to a new series. I'm now just about to start book four. And without the, the confidence that writing the short story gave me, I, I might never have uh, got very far with it. So for all these reasons, I, I think that writing a short story can be a very exciting thing to do. As an author, it's a change of pace. It gives you a chance to experiment, to try different uh, periods in history, different settings. If I, I go on holiday, as I did to, to Venice, uh, I think it's difficult to write a novel in a place. Not holiday, not, not holiday. 
Business or strategy? <laughs> you should be my accountant. Where have you been all my life? <laughs> so, so I, I find that going to these places inspires me. And, and I, I often come away with an idea for a short story. Um, whereas going to somewhere I'm not familiar with, I, I, I wouldn't feel confident about writing a whole novel set there. I think you have to be more soaked in the place. With a short story, maybe 5,000 words, it is easier uh, to do and, and, and great fun as well. You can stretch as a writer, you can try something different, you can try to improve, which I think is always really, really important for any writer trying to do a little bit better than you've done in the past. And short stories open the door to that. The, the experiments that you, you try, they don't always work, but it can give you a, a fresh a fresh way of approaching the writing. And that, that, that really does infuse me and why I continue to, to write short stories and, and to enjoy writing them enormously as well. I mean, personally, uh, I'm on very, very much on the same page as you. Obviously, I enjoy writing short stories tremendously, if only because of the instant gratification. Yeah. You work a week or two weeks, and then it, it's done. Yeah. Um, one as a novel, I mean, is is like uh, climbing a mountain. Yeah. Sometimes it's painful. Um, um, and the other thing you, that I found interesting in what you were saying is uh, something that's happened to me is. Not so much that, that some short stories have actually been uh, the stepping stone to a, to a novel. Yeah. Either because I thought the characters were interesting enough to use again, yeah. or in very recently, my last uh, three novels uh, all stem from short stories, but with a short story obviously rewritten, then becoming the final chapter. Because I had a short story, I was happy with a short story, but the characters were still with me and I, I want to know what, how did they reach that point? Yeah. It, it, <laughs> and that's how two, two, uh, two of my more recent novels happened. It, it, it's a liberating thing, I think, to write a short story. I, I wrote my first eight novels had urban backgrounds and then uh, my editor at the time, David Shelley, who, who you know well, um, uh, he, he, su he suggested that I write a, a new series with a rural setting and I wouldn't have, have really contemplated that but I'd written a short story just before that conversation took place set around the foot and mouth uh, outbreak in about 2001 and the experience of writing that short story gave me the confidence and confidence yeah. Yeah, was really important I think to pitch an idea to David which he he accepted and he commissioned the book and that became the, the late district mystery series which I'm, I'm still writing. Danuta, what about you? You're less prolific than Martin or me on the short story front but mm. I'm very young. I mean very you've young. probably got enough short stories for the <laughs> for the publisher be interested. I mean uh, how did you come? You started off writing novels, but uh, I started, actually, I started yes. off in journalism, oh. and um, I spent a lot of time writing very lucratively for women's magazines, which was lovely. And I really, really miss it because they've either all, they've all failed now, or after two thousand seven, two thousand eight, that fell off a cliff. So they would ask you to pitch ideas and then just get their staff members to write them for free. But in the old days, it was like nothing to get paid, like seven hundred pounds. And then you got an overnight stay at the Intercontinental with everyone running around trying to give you more things. It's brilliant. I had to do a week without men. So I literally had to do a week without men. So the husband had to move out and I had I went around trying to find women's clubs. I went to clubs, gym. And then the Intercontinental was trying to do this thing that it had a woman only floor, which, you know, I think if we can all see, as long as no police officers come in, should be so. Um, and actually made best friends with the publicist and then got a lot of freebies. That was great. Uh, but you also just got paid for it and it was wonderful. And I absolutely love doing those pieces um, because A, you get a nice firm edit, which is always good for one. And B, as you say, Maxim, you know, it's out, it's done, no mountain. You shape it, you form it. It's very satisfying. It's a short term gratification. So short stories, I don't write them as much 
definitely money in it so much but um and i have to have an idea but um it's for me it's like this is a shape oh i also i was going to say i was on a panel with val mcdermott and ann perry in alaska ages ago very, very luminous um and somebody in the audience stood up a guy and he went i've got a perfect novel but it's only forty-five thousand words and no publisher will take it but it's perfect and val literally grabbed the mic and went subplots and put it back down again <laughs> and the nice thing about short stories is if they're really clean and tidy you don't need a subplot you don't want a subplot it's there boom it's a gem you polish the gem you get it done I did a story for the anthology that Stella and I did called Tarte Noir, and it came out of me being very drunk, sitting around with friends late at night and going, what if you could get Phaedra, Medea, and Lady Macbeth on a talk show? And what would you call it? And that's not a novel. That's like, get in, tell what happened there, get out. So you never feel, and you know, I'm sure we've all had this, when you feel you're overstretching something, or something needs to, the shape is wrong and you need to fix it. You know, I never feel that with short stories. I've got it, it's done, boom, move on, thank you. That'll be 200 <laughs> Interestingly enough, you mentioned uh, the Tartanois anthology, which you co-edited with Stella. And of course, Stella has won the uh, Dagger twice and her story from Tartanois, Martha Grace, is in, uh, in Dagger's Draw. Yes, so uh, it's, a, it's a wonderful story, but we had so many wonderful stories, it's unbelievable. Mm -hmm. Unbelievable how many we got. We got Val to write a sex scene, which she was terrified about doing. Um, and now seems quite mild, but she was like, we were like, go there, go there, go there, and got her really drunk. Um, lots of, lots of people. Um, we got um, Lisa Jewell, who is really, was then a chiclet author, who's now gone to crime. But she wrote a story about um, a woman who moved in next to some really nasty, yobby boys and uh, who were really sexist and i was telling this story on radio 4 and live in the morning and realizing that basically they get trapped inside what i eventually said in desperation was a giant ladies place because i didn't think i would be able to say anything else on radio 4 at 11 o'clock in the morning than that but it was unbelievable and honestly now lisa is obviously writing crime and doing fantastically and i am that story, I was like, oh God, you can go really dark, you could totally do this. Mm -hmm. So that's that was quite that's quite satisfying to look back and see everybody. Danuta, hmm. what about well, con your confessions of a short story and novelist? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I've I think I've only published about eight short stories. Um, I find them difficult to write. It's that very tight structure you've got no wiggle room uh, every word's got to count um, and i don't often get ideas i get ideas for things that are too big they sort of explode all over the place and stop being short stories um, i the ones i've written tend to have been commissioned that's what pushes me into sort of thinking oh I've now got to think of a short story. And when I do that, when someone pushes me into it, I do really enjoy doing it. Um, and the last one was for actually a true crime series, uh, Mitzi Soretso's, um, she, I think the first one in her series was True Crime Serial Killers. And I was able to write about um, an encounter I had with Peter Sutcliffe, the um, Yorkshire Ripper, a very well-known British serial killer. I don't know how well-known he is in the United States. Uh, before he began his killing spree, um, and yet the short story it's genre is also. Anne Rowland, Ted Bundy. Yes, that's yeah. I know that that's amazing. I sort of wonder sometimes if these encounters aren't what leave us writing crime or something like that. Looking back, I realise I was very lucky, but at the time, I didn't quite realise uh, exactly how lucky I'd been. Can you please um, tell us everything? Tell us what happened. <laughs> By the book, right? Yeah, very simple. Um, my then partner was seriously ill in hospital um, and I used to go and visit him every night, uh, which involved walking through the what was then the red light district in Sheffield. Um, and I can remember sort of walking home and it was always quite unpleasant because 
a lot of drunk men around. And though I don't think that things have improved particularly in those days, no, no, nobody thought anything of men barracking women, walking home by themselves. You weren't allowed to be out in the streets, basically, by yourself, um, as Peter Sutcliffe came to prove. And um, anyway, I was walking home. I was in a particularly good mood that evening because um, my partner, who'd been very desperately seriously ill, um, was actually showing the first signs of recovery. He'd been in intensive care for three months, and you're, if you're in there for long, you, you, you really are in trouble. Um, and I was just walking up this, um, this particular area is very Sheffield, full of big stone houses, lots of trees and sort of dark roadways, but it was very run down. Um, in some ways, it was an, it's an area called Broom Hall. In some ways, it's an amazing place, great place for parties and things like that, or it was in those days. It's been cleaned up since then, so it's very boring now. Um, and I was, I was, it was about nine o'clock. It wasn't late, um, and it was empty. The, the, it was early in the week. There was no one around. Uh, even the street prostitutes were not out that that particular time. And I was just walking up the hill, and suddenly there was this guy walking beside me, and he said something like, "Pleasant evening." And so I was feeling quite buoyant. So I said, "Yes." I mean, in offensive remark, I said, "Yes, it is." Um, and I kept on walking because I didn't want to get involved in a conversation. It wasn't a good place to start talking to strangers. Um, but he kept walking with me and he kept asking me, sort of, I don't know, pushing me to talk. And then he said, I'm looking for the girl who uh, works around this area and charges five pounds a time. And I said, well, that's not me. And I turned to go, but he was kind of in my way. And so I, I lost my rag at that point and, and said where I'd been and what I'd been doing and how I was just, you know, how dare he come and accost me in a night like that, you know. Um, and I turned to walk away and he must have sort of fallen behind me. Suddenly he wasn't there anymore. And I looked back. And he was standing quite close behind me. And it was this really weird stance. The thought that came to my mind was a tennis player about to surf. He had one hand sort of down behind his back. And I just froze because I didn't know what I was seeing, but I knew that suddenly this situation was not just unpleasant, it was dangerous. And it felt like it was forever. But then someone came along and I just turned and walked up the street behind this guy. And when I look back, this guy had gone. And it wasn't until about, would it have been five or more years later, when they caught him, not far from there. They caught him in Sheffield, not far from Broom Hall, um, with someone I actually knew. I knew the woman who was in the car with him that night. Not well, but I did know her. And um, I saw his photograph. and. That's when I realized who it was I'd seen that night, who I'd been talking to. And I just kind of, you know, uh, retrospective terror, I think is the word that leaps to mind. Um, and I, I hadn't, until Mitzi asked me about this, I thought serial killers, I could write about Jack the Ripper, I couldn't. And then I suddenly thought, why don't I write that? And it was actually quite cathartic to write. Um, but yeah, but this, the other short stories have been very different, you know, but that particular one really sticks in my mind. It wasn't so long ago that I wrote it. Um, but generally, yeah, like uh, I mean, I'm, I'm definitely more of a novelist than a short story writer, though, judging by a couple of daggers under my belt, maybe I should focus on short stories because I obviously do them much better than I do novels. Well, Danuta, <laughs> nobody has done the treble yet. Oh. Yeah. Right. <laughs> okay, that's a challenge, Maxim. I shall go for that. <laughs> that's exactly what I wanted to say. Because obviously, I've edited, obviously, The Dagger's Drawn is a reprint anthology of necessity. Uh, but uh, I also edit a lot of original anthologies. And I found over the years, as Lauren also pointed out, uh, 
people don't write short stories for the money. This is no longer the time of the Esquire or the, or the New Playboy. York or the, or the Saturday Evening Post when people used to, or, or Playboy, where used to, people used to get between three and five thousand dollars for a story. Yeah. The Sunday Express doesn't pay. The Sunday Express does not pay for short stories. And if you talk to the person who commissions the short stories for the Sunday Express, she's outraged, outraged that anybody will expect to be paid for a short story because it's good public. Really? Just, yeah. yeah. But I find that as an editor, and I think Martin does, he edits quite a lot of anthologies himself, um, you can go to a lot of big name authors uh, and uh, if they can fit it in, they usually see it as a challenge. It's a labor of love, but it's also a challenge to do to come up with a new short story, particularly so when uh, you have uh, thematic anthologies. Uh, and I remember many years ago, uh, uh, together with Mike Ripley, who was then the Daily Telegraph's uh, crime reviewer, we noticed that there was a flourishing of new crime writers all over the UK. And we came up with the idea of doing fresh blood in asking all these new writers who come up with their first novels, can you write a short story? And we ended up doing three volumes. And uh, we had obviously the first ever short, one of the first ever short stories by Ian Rankin. Uh, we had Christopher Brookmeyer. We had, uh, and of course, Lee Child. As Lee keeps, on, Lee keeps on reminding me all the time, and Lauren, I mean, we commissioned his very first short story, which is why every time I want to do a new anthology, now he's retired, so he does, he's not writing anymore. He always says yes. Ask him. I mean, you can. I would still ask him. You never know. It's a short story. I would still ask Lee. I would. He's retired from doing novels, but it can't hurt to ask the, the short story. Ah, I see that Larry has finally arrived, but we he only has sound. He only has sound, but no picture. Larry, can you hear us? Hello. Hello, Larry. Welcome. Welcome, Welcome. How are you? You're okay. How how is it in Woodstock? It's lovely. <laughs> well, it's in lovely London. here. I, I'm sorry. There was some confusion here. I was on, you know, an hour ago waiting, and all I saw was a black rectangle. <laughs> I can see. I can see you're another technology expert, Larry. <laughs> so, anyway. Welcome. Oh, and there oh. I am. Welcome. Thank you. Anyway, we've been discussing Dagger's Drawn, so I'll come over to you straight away. Obviously, I think it's about 25, 30 years since we've actually seen each other. This but, is a long time. No, not right now. Is it that? It was in, it was in France. Oh. oh, you were at one of the French festivals, yes. That's right. And yeah. we saw each other there. Okay. Anyway, I was mentioning that and that could be 25 years. I mean, time in our age is kind of <laughs> an endless eternity that, you know, we don't count years anymore. Okay. Anyway, we're talking about the anthology and all the other participants are people who've won the short story dagger as you did. Uh, so I'll ask you the same question I asked all the others. Uh, I can remember, in fact, asking you for a short story because you'd come to London and we'd met for the first time. Right. And I was working on this particular project and said, oh, would you be interested in contributing a short story? And you kindly said yes. Um, now, what what happened after that? Where did the idea for your story uh, come? Uh, I'll remind, obviously, uh, the audience uh, that your yeah. story is called Funny Story. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, Where did the idea come from? The, the idea came from, I was in Germany on book tour, right? And, um, you know, I, I grew up in post-war America where Germans were depicted as these uh, eternal enemies, horrible people, militaristic, so forth and so on. Um, and, of course, on my German book tour, I found people I liked a great deal. And they were very civilized people. And I had enough historical memory to know that before World War II, the Germans were regarded as the most civilized people in Europe, maybe in the world. So it, there was this um, dichotomy. And I also thought it would be fun 
and I, and I was very good friends with my German translator, right? I mean, it was, it was a lovely time. So I decided to do a thing with uh, uh, a Jewish guy who has a German friend, and I decided to make them happy criminals. I thought that would be fun. And that's, that's the source of the story. Mm -hmm. And how surprised were you when it was shortlisted and then won the... Uh, the short story, uh, C.W. Dagger. Um, I am. I've been very lucky with projects, you know, and I, I'm more surprised when I make money. <laughs> and it's and, and that makes me actually happier. And I don't understand why the prizes don't win with money. But I, I'm hoping maybe tell me how this one will. <laughs> okay. I mean, I you know, I hope I hope there's a producer out there who takes a look at this story and says. Oh my God! This would make a great film. Which it was, it was. Because of course, one one of your earlier books uh, was uh, done as a movie. Uh, dog, was done as Wag the Dog. Yeah, two, two, Wag the Dog and Salvation Boulevard. Salvation oh. Boulevard. Um, a, as, it pretty, it's a good movie. It's not a bad movie, but it disappeared faster than any movie I've ever seen. And, <laughs> I don't know. It starred Piers Brosnan, Michael Kilme, Jennifer Connelly, Ed Kinnear. Um, had a great cast and a pretty good movie. And it got picked up by um, I, uh, IMF or something like that. And they swore they were going to show it a certain number of times in major cities. And it was screened in LA, for example, in one theater for a week at four o'clock in the afternoon. <laughs> you know, so yeah, so they've been two so far. And have you been, uh, since uh, Funny Story, obviously it's been quite some time, but have you continued writing short stories or have you been concentrating on other writing work? Um, you know, no, I only wrote, I've only written two short stories. Mm -hmm. um, and I've written so, and I've written other things, much more. You know, I did some journalism. I worked for Al Jazeera for a couple of years. That was great fun. Um, I just, I just did something I never wanted to do. I self-published a novel it's called Zombie Farm. Farm spelled P H A R M as in pharmaceutical. Um, and I have a. A new novel coming up sometime. I don't know when. We just signed the contract with Melville. Um, it's a sequel to my first three novels that take place 30 years later, which I think is a lot of fun. Um, so, that, I mean, that's kind of what I've been doing lately. And uh, oh, and I'm working on a, a, a film proposal with a guy named Juan Campanella. Uh, Fabulous director, uh, won an Academy Award for foreign film. So I'm excited about that. There we go. That's my current resume. Yeah. In fact, I have a copy. I got a copy of uh, Zombie Farm, but I haven't read it yet. Well, my promise if you don't like it, I'll give you your money back. <laughs> you know, the four dollars, right? <laughs> And on that note, <clears throat> I'm hello. going to... Hello, McKenna. Hello. Welcome hello. back. Hello. Thank you. I've just been sitting back enjoying the talk, um, as have the people watching. We have no questions. So That's I'm just going to... Um, yes, Lauren. Um, Maxim, has retitles, has anybody done Bring Me the Daggers yet? Um, well, nobody's come up with any... Right now, I just have a, a contract with a publisher with Daggers Drawn Volume 2. <laughs> Bring me the daggers. I'll keep it I in like mind. that. I'll bear it in mind. <laughs> Problem solved. <laughs> what but, I do. But, but, no I is. <laughs> but no royalty, Lauren. <laughs> <laughs> all right. Um, thank you all for being here. I'm glad Larry was able to join <clears throat> there at the end. And we got to hear oh, about right. You know what? It happens. Virtual events are fraught with peril. So um, I'm glad we, we all got here in the end. Um, Thank you all for being here. As I mentioned earlier, if you're watching, there's a link in the comments to order a copy of Daggers Drawn. 
Um, this has been a delight and I wish everyone a wonderful evening um, overseas. Larry, you and I can have a, a good day. It's still daytime for us. So um, I'm going to go ahead and sign us off. Thank you everyone um, again for your time and a great talk. Thank you for having us. Yeah, thank you. Yes, yes. Wow.